Okay, hello everyone. We are back after a two week break. Hi guys. So we're gonna Yep, we're just gonna review two movies today. I feel like okay, one of them is Finding Dory, which is something I think both of us are quite interested to talk about. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is Independence Day. Why are we talking about that? <laughs> I think it's because both of us watched it. But I mean, there are some stuff that I want to know because I didn't hate it as much as everyone else. Neither did, did I, I honestly, it? no. Yeah. In fact, I kind of I kind of felt about it the way you felt about Teenage with the Ninja Turtles out of the shadows, I think. Yeah, <laughs> alright. Well, not that much for me, but I I think it's alright. But anyway, before we start, do you want to say like what you've been up to? Any Any movie stuff that you did the past two weeks? Uh, also, hi, I'm Jet, and uh... Right, I keep forgetting that. Did I say what my name is? No, I don't think you who did. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, what, I whatever, am, who man. who cares? Yeah. Okay, so the past two weeks, what the, movie, the main thing that I did was the Sony Summit. So, Sony brought in three movies to Singapore for promotional purposes. So, they had Ghostbusters, Melissa McCarthy and Paul Feig were here. And for Inferno, they had Tom Hanks, Irfan Khan and Ron Howard. And then for the Magnificent Seven, they had the director, uh, Antoine Fuqua. So those were the. And no, three. Chris Pratt. No, Chris Pratt. Yeah, or no. He Denzel doesn't like Washington. us. Yeah, I was sad. No. Like when he came for Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, he didn't come for Guardians of the Galaxy, and yeah. what else did he not come in? Yeah. We we got Sorry. the we got the B team really for sad. Guardians of the Galaxy, but it was still cool. I mean, James Gunn came, so who knows? Maybe for yeah. part two, we'll have Chris Pratt next year. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Hopefully. So um, I can't actually really talk about the footage that we saw. They made us sign a non-disclosure agreement. But I saw, like I think, about 20 minutes of Ghostbusters and the first mm. 25 minutes of Inferno and like a couple of short clips from uh, Magnificent Seven. So yeah, I, I can't say anything about that. And I also can't really talk about the interviews. But uh, my interview with Paul Feig and Melissa McCarthy will be out really soon in the upcoming that issue. Is awesome. So keep a look out for that. Yeah. Paul Feig was okay. really, really nice. Like, he signed... I have The only signature I have is his. I don't have anyone else's autograph. And what was really funny is I tried to take a selfie with uh, Tom Hanks on the red carpet in the midst of all the chaos, and it is the single blurrest photograph I have ever tried to take. So... <laughs> I, <laughs> it's all right. It's, At least you, you kind of had it. And there's a story behind it. I can show people that say, See? I have a story. <laughs> I'm trying to and find like, a silver lining. Blur? Yeah. I mean, like, they'll ask you why is it blowing your... And you can reply, because I want to tell the story. Yes, yes. So it's all on purpose. There's a whole artistic mission behind it. Yeah. So th- that was the main, like, movie-related thing I did. And and then I saw uh, Independence Day Resurgence in... I was on holiday uh, in, in Turkey, and I just got back, like, yesterday. So I'm pretty shaken by uh, what we, we heard about the terrorist attack. My, um, my family yeah. and I are okay. Uh, uh, I'm very grateful for that, but it's a really shocking, terrible thing that that, that happened. Um, I saw Independence Day Resurgence in a format called 4DX. So it's a format we don't have in Singapore, and it's something like the box with stuff on top of it. It's really super gimmicky. Uh, I had mm-hmm. fun with it. So, you know, the, sheet, the, yeah. Yeah, the seats move, and then they have fog, they've got mists that they spray, they have uh, strobe lights, and they even have scents. They've got one smell that Ew. they keep on using and it's a sulfury smell so they use that for like in the wake of explosions or when you walk into the alien ship and then they release like an artificial sulfury smell <laughs> honestly i think independence day is a really good film for d exactly yeah it was I, I felt like i really got my money's worth because so much of it was the dog fights and flying through space and and so there, there were a lot of kinetic effects it was really fun i think that actually the motion in 4DX is even stronger than D-Box. Like, the seat moves more. That is... Hmm. I will try D-Box one day. Yeah, and, and it sucks because in Singapore, like, in the D-Box halls, the seats are all the way at the back. But yeah. in 4DX, the whole theatre was just 4DX seats. So it's a smaller theatre, but every seat moves. So that was pretty cool, yeah. I I, I really think they should have put the D-Box roll right in the middle, man. Because that's how you do it. it you, you want yeah. the seats to move to give you immersion, and then... You put you separate yourself further from the screen. I don't get it. <laughs> well, hopefully they'll change their minds about the D box thing. Yeah. But um, yeah. So I watched Independence Day unfortunately with no moving seats. I could have because there was a D box inside, but I think it was all taken out. Oh, okay. I saw it on the I saw it on like a Thursday afternoon. All right, opening and day. And it was full of people for some reason. Opening day, yeah. I guess they just wanted to watch Singapore burn. So. <laughs> um, Singapore, yeah, comma I, China. I, 
Honestly, I really think that they wanted to watch Singapore burn. That's why there's so many people there. It was a, it was a Thursday. But okay, anyway, besides that. Um, so, interestingly, I, I actually won some Golden Village um, TMNT prize. It's a really useless prize, though. No, no, that's cool. Tell us about it. It's a freaking 3D. It's like those TMNT 3D glasses. You know, it's kind of like their bandanas. Oh, nice. Uh, what color did you get? Uh, I got all four. Nice. Okay, so you can yeah. grab like so three other people. You won one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Don't know what to do with it. <laughs> I, cause I put like the the question that they had was, hey, so who's your favorite turtle? And then it was three a.m. Right. So I decided I'm just gonna participate. Uh, I'm just gonna participate for fun, and I won for some awesome. reason, which I think it's. I'm pretty sure it's a lucky draw more than anything. No. Because I no. went back. <laughs> I went back to look at what I wrote and it was like full of garbage English. What was it about Leo? Yeah. Oh, cool. I, I think you, maybe you won because no one else wrote Leo. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, I was quite surprised because there were like a lot of people who participated in this and the vote seems to be really like balanced between all four turtles. Interesting. So yeah. that was really cool. That's yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah, do you want to write Donatello 3D glasses? I, I really don't know what <laughs> Maybe. to do Maybe. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. Like, 3D glasses, I mean, uh, as long as the theatre is providing them, it's kind of useless to have your own because it will not work with any other system. <laughs> and I also got like Deadpool and Zootopia and the Disney, uh, uh, Disney's Aladdin, the diamond version on Blu-ray when I went to Malaysia. Nice. And I watched the Deadpool commentary. It's quite good. I liked like, it. It yeah. has a lot of very useful information inside. So those people who like Deadpool, and if you have money for it, get the Blu-ray because there's two, there's two DVD commentaries inside and both of them are really, really good. Yeah, I've, I've only listened to the... I got a Blu-ray as well and I only listened to the one with the writers and Ryan Reynolds and it's quite... What, what to me is the most interesting is all the permissions they had to ask. Like they had to ask permission to use... A uh, VR the space, or they they had to ask Hugh Jackman for permission to use the space, and it's the process of how they got clearances and what doors were open to them or what doors were closed to them was something really interesting to me. Okay, so do you want to talk about the movie? Yeah, all right. Which one do you want to do first? Let's do Finding Dory first because that one is the most interesting. Sure. I think right. Independence Day. We're just gonna spoil everything. Yeah, because yeah. Like just like they destroyed everything, we're gonna spoil everything. Yeah, if if you don't care about Independence Day, the reviews aren't going to, you know, encourage you to watch it anyway. <laughs> so, you either watched it or you don't care. Exactly. That's my yep. take on it. Alright. Okay, so, Finding Dory. What is the plot about, Jet? Finding Dory takes place a year after the events of Finding Nemo, uh, in which Nemo the clownfish... He got lost and his father, Marlin, went on a huge odyssey to go and track him back. And of course, accompanying Marlin was Dory, who is a blue tang stricken with short-term memory loss. At the beginning of this film, Dory suddenly has flashbacks and has dreams and memories to her childhood. And the whole movie is about her trying to trace down her parents and where she came from. So this massive adventure takes uh, Dory, Marlin and Nemo all the way from the Great Barrier Reef to the uh, to Monterey Bay in California. And what is it called? It's called the Marine Life Institute here in the film. So that's where Dory was born, and that's where her parents are supposed to be. And they meet a bunch of characters, including this very grumpy, cantankerous octopus, or septopus actually, because he's lost the one leg, named Hank. And Hank has a camouflage powers and sort of reluctantly helps Dory look for her parents. We, we also meet uh, Becky the Loon uh, <laughs> and... Uh, there are otters, there are sea lions, one of whom is voiced by Idris Elba. And it's just like the first movie, it's a big epic road trip. And uh, character development happens along the way. We learn stuff about uh, life. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm not very good at synopsizing this because it is a road trip. So it's, yeah, it's about the adventure. So what did you think of Finding Dory Jet? I wasn't sure what to make of it going in. I was a little bit skeptical and I wasn't really convinced by the trailers, but honestly, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I, I definitely don't think it's as good as Finding Nemo, but considering the gap of time and considering the fact that it's not exactly the world's most necessary or demanded sequel, I enjoyed it. I think they did a good job. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the first Di Finding Dory. I think it was my favorite Pixar movie for some time. Me too, yeah. And then it slowly became Monsters, Inc. 
Mm. But you know, like like you know, who I I love father son stories, and that is a classic father son story where you know the father is super uptight, or maybe he, like he doesn't really understand his son, and his son wants to rebel against him. You know the typical kind of story arc. Yeah. But I think Finding Dory, it's such a beautiful story about how far a father would go. Finding Nemo, for his you son. mean? Sorry, Finding Nemo. Yeah, damn it, this is gonna be a problem. I just know it. <laughs> but it's、um, alright. Yeah, I I really enjoyed Finding Nemo a lot. So when they announced Finding Dory, I, I was super skeptical about it. I think I think I didn't like Finding Dory that much.、Mm. And a lot of it, it's not because of I I don't think it's nostalgia. I really don't. It's just that the story itself doesn't appeal to me. And I love Dory, but I never cared for her backstory. And I didn't need to know oh where did she get, uh just keep swimming coming from where did she get all her. You know her songs or whatever, and how she came to be. Like I'm not interested in that. She's not, she's not a particular. I don't know. Like I guess they wanted to add depth to her character, but when I watched this film, I feel like it just ruined the mystery in her. Right. Which is like I don't know. It's like something I didn't care for. Like I don't know where she came from, and I don't want to know where she came from. But. You know, because I love Finding Nemo, I want to watch Finding Dory just to see what it is and what I got. A lot of things I just didn't need an origins of her story,、uh, of where all her, where her mindset comes from. I don't know. Does that make sense? It does. And honestly, I thought the same thing as well. And if you go back to one of the previous episodes, I said that Dory is a side character by design, and I was very worried what would happen when they made her the main character. But I think they really assuaged my fears. They made me care about her backstory, something which I similarly felt I did not really need. And I think the way they did that was there's such a purity and there's such a simplicity to her backstory. She's a kid. She has short-term memory loss. She couldn't find her parents. And there's something about that which doesn't, which which it feels really earnest. It feels like it doesn't feel convoluted. It doesn't feel like they went back and they had to. Jump through hoops, you know, Star Wars prequel style to connect everything、mm-hmm. and tell you where everything came from. I think you make a really、yeah. good point about how, like, we don't need to know where "Just Keep Swimming" comes from, but knowing that it's a song, you know, that knowing the origin to me actually made it all the more powerful. And I, I actually had chills when we found out where "Just Keep Swimming" comes from because it gave it much, it gave it so much more weight, and it made it, it gave it actually a bit of sadness. And and I liked that. I I felt that, in a way, I read this review that says it's a metaphor for caring for a child with special needs, like a child who has a、uh, mental difficulties or learning disabilities, and that makes a lot of sense to me. I think that it it is one of those movies, not to the extent of Inside Out, but it's one of those movies that is a good starting point as a conversation for families. But you see, when you argue with you know the whole mental disability thing. But you see them making fun of that author. Was it an author or seal? I I can't tell the difference. I'm so sorry.、Um, no, I、the、think it's seal. Yeah, the the yeah. loon. Like <laughs> they make fun of him, and he's more of a comedic character. So it 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 kind of just、uh, hang on. I'm looking for the right word for it, but it it doesn't make sense to me that you look at Dory and make her look so. Right. Not pitiful, but you you sympathetic. You ha- can yeah. You have to understand her. You have to understand her condition. But at the same time, they're doing, they're making this, this weird looking seal. You know, this funny looking seal be, the the butt of the joke. Oh, the seal, a、uh, G- Gerald or or Becky. Who is that weird seal where they're like barking at him? Oh, Gerald. Get off. Yeah, Gerald. Yeah, that guy. I I、oh, maybe that's why I don't like it. Oh okay, I I didn't read that he was disabled. I read that he was that they were bullying him. They were picking on him.、Mm-hmm. Oh like but with Becky, yeah, like like Becky the loon is a bit crazy, and I guess why I was okay with that is that the loons don't actually speak, so perhaps they are portrayed as having a slightly lower level of sentience. The authors don't talk either, which I thought was a good idea.、Mm-hmm. Yeah,、oh, um, they were, they were cute, and and they acknowledge that. Authors are cute by default, and they use they weave that in, and like I I thought the set pieces in this were quite impressive, especially the climax. I was very surprised by the way it ended, by the final 
uh, chase the conversation. Can we spoil things or are we allowed to spoil things here? No, no, no. All right, okay, so I think I'm... we'll talk about that in the end. Sure, but I'm okay. not a fan of the climax at all. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and Just putting it out there first. I, I think for me, what I did like is that you see character development, you see how Marlin and Nemo's relationship has changed since the events of the first movie, and yet their core personalities are still the same. Marlin is still overprotective at heart, and Nemo still, you know, he takes chances, he's optimistic, and he's not afraid to rebel a little bit against his father, but they have both been affected by their adventure. It's not like they didn't learn anything or they didn't change at all from the first one. Yeah. I did you like how do you like the subplot with uh Marlin and Nemo? I thought the way it ended was kind of coincidental and I didn't really like it. Uh, I, I And I felt like it was a very it was a way to pad the movie out, but at the same time I'm kinda glad that they didn't just shove them to the side and didn't give them anything to do with this story because they are Dory's family anyway. Yes. But yeah. I, I don't know, it just feels weird like I don't like the transition between what Dory is doing and then what Marlin and Nemo are doing and what what kind of conflict they're having at that point yeah I think that's always that's always the danger of when you structure a road trip movie and you have two parallel road trips but I honestly think they did it really well and the reason why I liked it is because there's a focus and the two subplots don't actually split your focus it's serving the same end goal of finding Dory's Mm -hmm. parents so you see what Dory is doing and then you go over to what Marlin and Nemo are doing. And what helps is that they both meet or come across the same characters at different points in the story. So it doesn't feel disjointed to me, even though you are splitting your time between these two parties. I don't know, because I think that the Dory side story, it's a lot more interesting than Marlin and Nemo's side, because they're kind of arguing about Dory and his or, or rather, they're arguing about Marlin's kind of insensitive remark at Dory. Yeah. And to me, that's not very interesting as to, you know, meeting new characters. Although I think the sales were good, though. And that bird, that the seagull, loon. he was kind of fun. Becky the loon, mm-hmm. yeah. You trust Becky? Becky is eating a cup! <laughs> <laughs> I I laughed so much at this movie. I, I really, really enjoyed really? this movie. Yeah, I, I mean, I thought I, it was really funny. Oh, to me, I, I don't know. Like, I didn't really find it funny. I was just more... I like I like the new characters. Okay, I'm going to say something really positive because I, I didn't hate this movie at all. I think it's it's kind of like how I feel about Good Dinosaur where it had good moments, but it didn't really... As a whole, I didn't really feel anything by the end of it. Right, like, yeah. It was just a movie that I watch. And it maybe it just doesn't appeal to me. And that's I I guess that's all right because I can tell that there's greatness in this film and I can tell that people are able to relate to Dory because she's such a there's something about her that just makes it so relatable and she's just so I I don't know how to say it like she's one of those characters where she's very down to earth she's just super likable and because of that people are able to identify themselves in her but I I couldn't do that that's why maybe I just didn't care for the story. I didn't care whether she found her parents or not. Um, but I like the three new characters that they introduced, which is um Hank. Yep, Hank the, the octopus Septimus. that you're talking about, Bailey and Destiny, which are the two whales. Oh yeah. Uh, the bel- in the aquarium. I thought both of them were super good. The beluga whale uh, Bailey and Destiny the short sighted whale shark. And I-, I love how when she meets Story again, she says, Oh, you know, I'm I'm your friend here and then she does this thing where she claps her fins. And it's really, really cute because the fins mm-hmm. like barely come together under uh, uh, underneath the her, her her body, and it's also fun because of the size contrast of Dory, who's a blue tang, and there's a whale shark, yeah. which is the largest fish. Yeah, and I like uh, that's why I like the Dory storyline a lot more because of all, all three of these characters. They're super interesting. They're super funny, and Hank has a good character arc yes. as well, and he is a very interesting character. Great voice and, acting by Ed O'Neill. Like, really, really yeah, good voice acting. And apparently he didn't know there was a starring role. <laughs> I thought it was just a cameo. So That's good cute. Job. <laughs> and I love, um, I love Ty Burrell. Like, I think he's fantastic in a lot of things. Yeah. And I loved him in Modern Family, and he's my favorite character there. 
So it's great to see him. He's so Ty Burrell in this film. He cool. is. It is very Ty Burrell. And there's actually a bit of a modern family reunion because Ed O'Neill and Ty Burrell are in this. Yeah, too bad they... I don't think they had an on-screen time That's together. That's true, yeah. I think they missed out. <laughs> mm-hmm, yeah. But, um, yeah, I like those three characters. And I think those three make, made the movie interesting for me. I thought they were very funny and I loved... I really love when they kept appearing on the screen because when when Dari left the two wheels, I was like, oh darn it! I guess they're not coming back. Yeah, but gone. they did come back, and they were. But they do come back, and they were important they were to the amazing. climax. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the thing about like oh sorry um the thing about these new characters is while I did enjoy a lot of them, sometimes it felt like they were trying too hard to mimic or get close to Nemo's friends from the fish tank. In, in Finding Nemo because those characters are so iconic and so memorable uh, especially like Willem Honestly, Dafoe's I, kill I, I never felt that okay maybe Willem Dafoe's character is kind of the Hank character of this film a little bit yeah I, I guess but they good. have I think they have two different storylines or two different arcs that's why I could never put two and two together right because you know Hank wants to stay in the tank and then Gil is his name Gil? Like, yeah Gil the scar yeah Gil yeah. wants wants to get out and then he has a scar because he wants to escape and he's like this super cool character. That's right. Yeah, yeah. so that's why that's why I didn't really I wasn't bothered by that. And I think it 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 really just I don't know. Like I what I appreciate about this film is that it wasn't as much as a, a finding Nemo ripoff as I thought it would be. Yeah, it wasn't the same thing all over again. But at the same time I preferred finding Nemo because I liked that story more. Yeah. Oh, but I do love the mystery element to this film. Yes. About what happened to Dory. Yeah. So I'll give the film that. Yeah, I thought that was something that Finding Nemo... Because uh, Finding Dory... It, it, sorry, Finding Nemo was very linear. And Finding Dory, it had these like cutbacks... I mean, sorry, these flashbacks. That's and true, And kind yeah. of figuring out what's happening. And I think that kind of story structure was really cool in the film. And it kept, it kept me engaged. I agree, yeah, they parcel out the information and, and you think that you know Dory, that that's all there is to know, but when they reveal what happened with her and what happened with her parents, the more you find out, not only does it make you feel stronger for her in this movie, it also gives context to what happened in Finding Nemo. And in Finding Nemo, she's very much the comic relief. But when you find out there's a tragedy to the character, maybe you feel like a little bit bad for laughing at her, but at the same time, you also have more respect for Dory as a character. Mm -hmm. um, like, what you said about The Good Dinosaur, uh, there are a lot of people who have drawn a comparison, and I completely see where that's coming from, because like with both movies, there, there isn't really a big villain, it's more of a road trip structure, but I liked this more than Good Dinosaur. I felt that the obstacles that arise in Finding Dory were more colourful, and the way they got from point A to point B was a lot more interesting. And I was surprised how much of this movie is spent outside of the water. And if they figure out how to get from tank to tank or from ocean to tank and how they have to jump and leap and cross boundaries. And I thought that was really fun. The Almost like, you know, like a platformer, the way they had to get from point A to point B. Yeah. Sorry, I was just thinking about the scene, about a really funny scene that I want to talk about later. Yep. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't like the climax. Let's talk about the climax without spoiling too much. I thought it was a little bit bloated. Like, I thought they were trying to pad out the movie a lot because one thing happens and then suddenly this other thing happens and then when you think this thing is gonna resolve everything, nope, something else happens that causes a lot of destruction. I actually kind and of... And I don't like that... I don't like the message at the end of the film that I want to talk about in the spoilers, but I don't think Pixar realizes how much... how much they influence kids. And I don't like what they tried to say at the end of the film. Mm, because okay. some fishes, you know, some some of them can't do what they did at the end of the film. Yeah. And it will just instantly kill them. <laughs> well, I, I guess, yeah, it's, it's, well, within the logic of this, apparently, fishes understand English human language. And they speak in English. Like, we don't have that translation convention thing where they show us, you know, from their point of view. Like, some movies, they have animals talking to each other and then they'll cut to the human point of view and they're just barking at each other. They don't have that in Finding, Finding Nemo and Finding Dory. So I felt that that, 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 is, that is one of those plot technicalities that is quite interesting. 
the climax surprised me because there's like an action movie element to it. And also, I like that. I, I, I sort of figured out, okay, this is how we're going to resolve it. But there were surprises, there were a few more layers, and there were a few more obstacles to get to the resolution than I was expecting. I feel like there were too many obstacles. Maybe. Yeah, may- maybe there was one too many. But I felt that the way it came together and how it was, there was an element of teamwork and how they brought in some of the characters from earlier on to solve the situation. I liked that. And, and I think that there-, there was a scale to it that I kind of admired because with this movie, I was... When I heard that it was going to be set in just the Marine Life Institute, I was like, oh, you know, it will not have the scale of crossing, traversing the entire ocean. It will just be kind of self-contained and it will be like a scaled-down sequel. But I didn't feel that at all. I felt that there was still a bit of a grandeur and a bit of a majesty to it. Mm, yeah, but I mean, I didn't feel that way. I felt like it was a lot more... Not not that there's anything wrong. Like, that's not my main problem. Mm-hmm. But it felt a lot smaller. But at the same time, it felt a lot more focused too. So I didn't mind that. Yeah, there's, there's a bit of a give and take. And and I guess, like, I felt the same way as you did going in. Like, how different can this be? You're looking for a fish. And how, how many different ways can you look for someone who's lost? But the ways were different enough that, that I really came around to it in the end. And, oh, uh, when do you want to talk about Piper? <laughs> who's Piper? Piper is the short film in front. Oh. Oh, yeah, that was cute. I love that. I like that I, I love the way it. Um, yeah, let's just talk about it now. Okay. I I love the way the the resolution, like how he learns. It's kind of like game design, you know. Yeah. Like you see this character struggling, and then he he sees this thing doing this particular action, and then he follows it, and because of that, he learns something. I think I thought that part was like super freaking cool. It's a problem and solving and element to it. Yeah. Yeah, and I love the character design. It's so cute. And the sound design too. I really wonder, oh man, the render is so damn cool it too. Is, it, it is so impressive. My jaw dropped. I was like, this is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Like, and yeah. animated or otherwise. And and I felt that the way they anthropomorphized the animals, like the way they gave them a, just a tiny little bit of human characteristics, they found the sweet spot, man. Because if you make something too... And, and it's such realistic. a different... Yeah, that you, you fall into the uncanny valley, but if you... And or if you just do a straight realistic thing, you cannot find it cute. You cannot imbue it with human emotion. And that was really, really well done. I, I love how the entire story was told without dialogue. That it was all mm-hmm. music, it was all sound. And it's so simple, but it's a complete story. And it's yeah. cute, and it's moving, and it's fun. And I love the way Piper was animated because he's like he's running up, he's super fast, and then he stops, then he jumps a little bit, and then he he like opens up his beak. It's so cute how fast it is, and then after that it slows down, yeah, and there's... like it just sticks at one pose. And I love I love the part where um the giant wave comes over him, and then the next shot you see him like trembling. It's so cute. And then they cut to him being Sorry. traumatized in the nest. Yeah, that was yeah. hilarious. The timing on that cut was perfect. And yeah, the, what, what you're talking about, the very twitchy bird-like movements. And and mm-hmm. that's an element of realism. And, and like it also goes back to in Finding Nemo, I remember watching a uh, behind-the-scenes documentary on Finding Nemo, and they were talking about how they animated the fins moving, the cycle of the fins. And that's something that you would not actually notice, but the way fish move their fins to propel themselves or to stay in one place, there's a whole lot of detail in that. And I think that the research at Pixar does observing and Disney in general observing from real life observing from animals and the way they incorporate that has always been very fascinating to me mm-hmm. and yeah mm-hmm. I, I would love to see if Piper is really based on like a real life sandpiper that they met and they spent time with one particular bird because that would be fun mm-hmm. like how you know Rocket so Raccoon cute. was based on one main raccoon they, they all the animators went to meet this raccoon and then they based Rocket Raccoon on that oh I didn't know that I know like there was a sloth in the Croods, and they used that sloth as a reference. Right, to. yeah. Yeah, so... Okay. Yep, okay. Spoilers? So, <laughs> you want to talk about spoilers for Finding Dory? Now, um, not a fan of what would Dory do to kids. Right, because right. Because what would Dory do means, hey, 
just improv everything, which I did not <laughs> Because you cannot go through life thinking, hmm, what would Dory do? Because that's a stupid idea and you shouldn't do that, especially in a life or death situation. They got lucky. That's all they got. Yeah. And they weren't, I don't know. Like, it's such a terrible message to tell kids. Don't plan your life ahead. Just, just keep, I mean, it's okay to fail and to plan something and then to fail and then to come up from it. Like, it's okay to experiment, but don't be stupid and just do things that w- will threaten your life. Yes, oh, sorry. I, I totally get that. And that's a really, really good point you raised. Uh, for me, what I, what I got into that, what, I mean, what I got out of that was you're juxtaposing the way Marlin does things and the way Dory does things. And it's either extreme. And what actually solves the problem or the compromise they reach is when Marlin keeps his Marlinness, but he takes on a bit of Dory's style. So he augments the way he would normally do. He doesn't throw away his rationalization, but he adopts the improvisational nature and the spontaneity spontaneity of Dory in addition to the way he meticulously plans things or worries about everything. And I I felt that it was like like what Dory do what would Dory do is about finding solutions that are non-traditional. I don't really think it's about winging it all the time. I think it's about looking at it from a different perspective. And for example, the big one that they did was they plotted, you know, jumping on the fountains. And that is Mm -hmm. something where there's an element of risk, but there's also an element of planning to it. Does it kind of make sense? Yeah, it does, but I don't buy it. I'm sorry. (laughs) That's okay, yeah. I, I think... Like, the the whole arc, and what I find very satisfying about Marlin's arc is that he's he's very tightly wound, but you see the reason for it. And the reason mm-hmm. for it is so compelling and so heartbreaking in the first movie. And then for him to let go of all of the stuff, all of his hang-ups and all of the uh, rules by which he has been bound is a process. And I felt that he, he did grow through this movie. He grew through the first one, and then he grew through this one as well. Yep. And it was it was not so much I felt about, you know, throwing away common sense, but uh seeing the merits of a different way of doing things and of not looking down on someone because they do things differently from you or you feel that they're not as equipped for whatever job it is as you are. And and that's what it what started the conflict is that he looked down on Dory. And and maybe it was like, okay, you know, you use you, you take your strengths and your weaknesses as a package and you learn how to best use those strengths. That's what I got from it. About how he... You know, I felt... Sorry. Sorry, go, I go ahead. I felt so sad. I felt so sad when Martin told Dory, uh, why don't you just sit there and forget or something like that? Yeah, when he snapped at her. Yeah, like, like you yeah, always like, do, he said. Yeah, I'm like, oh, no. And I love both those characters. So I was really upset to see them, you know, arguing like that. And And... I don't blame Marlin at all because, Marlin you know, yeah. Nemo's life was in danger. So that was kind of... It, it's really... I like that... Like you said, I like that Marlin has this balance between... He has... He is tight and he is strict. And he's sort of a... I guess you would say a prune, I guess. Is that the right word for it? Like, he's very uptight. I'm, and I... he kind of ruins people's fun, I guess. But at the same time, you can tell why. And it's for the safety of others and especially for his son who he lost and he doesn't want to lose again because he loves his son so much yeah and yeah so i like marlin's character in this film a lot even though he kind of got my nerves a little bit but not too much i do like him a lot i i did um, as well yeah yeah i don't know i still think the what would dory do thing didn't i i didn't think as well as you did so kids who have the same intelligence as I do may not think <laughs> the way you do. No, 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 no. So I don't like it. <laughs> I, I totally get where you're coming from. And yeah, that, that's, that's how it may be interpreted. And maybe it's just me like putting, trying to rationalize it into something that is less negative. But it's definitely a valid point that a kid could watch it and go, oh, you know, I would just do the stupid thing. But, <laughs> but I don't think that was the message or that was intended of the film. It could be read. Yeah, I really hope yeah. that they have a commentary on this because I want to know the rationality behind that phrase. Yeah, and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I w- okay, so the last part also I've one of my huge problems with this film was 
at the end, she releases all the fishes where they said that they need to be inhabited because they're sick and they'll forever be sick or they need to be under... Quarantine. Uh, under quarantine, yeah. And I thought, why are you freeing all those fishes when they're just going to die anyway? <laughs> right? Like, yeah, like, yeah. That That's a bit of a plot hole. Hmm. Uh, oh, did you know that the the voice of Nemo was actually in this? Yeah, the previous one. That's right. Alexander was... Gould had a voice cameo, and the kid is now twenty two years old or something. I uh, but I just I hate the role that he got. He wasn't a fish. He was a human being that got that was a butt of a joke. What which, what character right? was he again? He was the the guy that's like, oh man, we're gonna lose our jobs. Oh. The guy who's driving. Oh right, what yeah. A terrible role. <laughs> He deserves better, man. I'm sorry. I I like that they got back Bob Peterson for Crush. And his Crush? Oh, then okay, the sea yeah. Turtle, yeah. He's Bob Peterson. Yeah, I like his cameo. Bob Peterson is also the voice of Duck from Up, and he's like a co-director at Pixar. And and I really, it's really interesting how talented the Pixar directors are. Like if you listen to Brad Bird in The Incredibles, it completely blew mm-hmm. my mind. So it's I I always think that it's fun that they let the directors have little voice roles, and it actually doesn't feel indulgent. And the worst part is, well, not the worst part, and the best part is that they're actually really iconic characters too. Yeah, they're memorable and they're scene stealers, but you don't feel that the director is making the movie all about him or herself, you know what I mean? Yep, yep. Yeah, Um. so uh... the, the thing that people always look out for as an easter egg in Pixar movies is A113. And A113 is a little bit like, you know, THX 1138 for Star Wars and George Lucas movies in that it's a reference to the classroom at CalArts, the California Institute of the Arts, that a lot of Pixar and Disney directors studied at. And in this movie, it's actually really easy to find. It's the license plate of the truck at the end. The license plate mm-hmm. is CAA113. I didn't catch that. <laughs> I was looking for A113 for the whole movie, and I was very satisfied when I found it. Do you see the pizza truck? Yeah. I'm sure it's at a highway somewhere. It's, it's, a, it's the license plate of the truck itself. Oh no, as in the pizza truck. Oh, the pizza truck. Yeah, yeah. I that's right, the Pizza Planet truck. I I was looking for that too and I didn't find it, but you're right. It's probably in in the highway and and I was like at at the end of the movie I was like, "Oh my gosh, they ended finding Dory with a car chase." And I just found that notion very delightful. <laughs> I don't know why. I just didn't expect It was a little bit too much, but uh, yeah. I'm watching a film about I'm watching a film about fishes, and my biggest problem with it was it had a car chase at the end. It's not realistic. <laughs> that's, kind of, that's, a, that's a really dumb argument. Uh, um, yeah, I, I guess maybe it crosses a line a little bit, but I'm trying to think of something similar in the first movie that that like really pushed the bounds, and maybe it's the escape. The escape, as in from like like the 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 whole oh yeah. oh the swim down thing yeah, yeah, that was yeah. Kind of dumb. a little bit. <laughs> Um, all right. So I I love um I need to stop saying um I love ba- is it Bailey the beluga Bailey's whale the, the Thai barrel yeah whale, right? <laughs> I love I love the way he's like ooh I see it ooh <laughs> <laughs> I burst out laughing and <laughs> and um the part where I think Dory was lost in the in, where was she lost at she was lost in one of those she was stuck in the pipes, pipes. yeah and yeah they are devouring she, her. <laughs> <laughs> it's devouring her <laughs> I love it Like I think Bailey is my favourite character Mainly because I love Ty Burrell And that's a very Ty Burrell character Yeah like sort of neurotic And my, mm. my single favourite joke in the whole thing is Hello I'm Sigourney Weaver And I just <laughs> lost it I I could not keep it in every time Sigourney Weaver narrated the aquarium And, and I felt like You know Pixar doesn't really do pop culture references The way DreamWorks does but there was something so mm-hmm. clever about that, and part of it is because it's such a random character, it, it, uh, it's such a random celebrity. Uh, it it kind of is, but Sigourney Weaver is also like she's also done quite a number of uh, ads, if I'm not wrong, like car commercials and different commercials. Like in the US, every commercial that you watch on TV is actually narrated by a celebrity, and I think it was Leia Michelle from Glee, and one of her talents is she's able to tell whose voice it is. So they had a little yeah. segment on Ellen where they played her like a bunch of clips for like Mercedes or or some uh, uh, food company and she was able to tell who was narrating it. And the fun thing about Sigourney Weaver is she has a role in the Pixar movie before she was Axiom, the voice of the computer in WALL-E. Oh, okay. Yeah, she that. was the voice of the ship in WALL-E. Yeah, and, and I like that they brought her back in. And of course, you know, she, she has that... Uh, 
she must have voiced the computer in something as well. But yeah, I I feel that it's <laughs> I laughed so much at that. It was random, but it was it was also like you would think you know Morgan Freeman or something like that. But yeah, I like Connie Weaver. My my jaw dropped when I first heard it, and I love that Dory replied to her. Yes, and like, Dory, Sigourney Weaver. And Sigourney right. Weaver told us so, and and it was so funny <laughs> every time they acknowledged. And yeah, that that also brings up the whole thing of they understand English. Like she could read English in the first one. She could read, you know, forty two P Sherman all of you way, and and that's a whole really interesting uh element of it. Like the communication. If fish are sent in to that extent, then Oh, should we be eating them? That whole kind of thing. <laughs> mm, it's just a movie. Yeah, right? I know. <laughs> Jerry um, has to pull me back to reality. <laughs> I, I, I like... Oh, wait, sorry. I did not like the ending where she finds her parents. Okay, I, I thought the way she found her parents was kind of cool. The shells, but, yeah. Yeah, but I did not like how, okay, Marlin and Nemo are stuck inside the truck, so she has to go get it. And in the end, when Marlin and Nemo are out, she's still stuck in the truck. And then, right, know, yes. it's like, it's, it's so, it's, there's so much happening in the, in the climax and so many layers to it that I, I kind of just went, okay, you're, you're clearly just dragging this part out. <laughs> and you didn't need Nemo and, you didn't need to rescue Nemo and Marlin at all you could just like be there and then okay they just have to control the truck but i feel like they needed to do that because they needed more they the runtime needed to be longer or something i don't know yeah and i I felt like they needed to have everyone have an equal part in saving the day what did marlin and nemo do i mean marlin and nemo did the first half oh okay. yeah And and Hank was driving the truck. I was like an octopus is driving the truck, and and I just I just enjoyed that. And and when the truck flew off the cliff, and then they did what a wonderful world, and it was like falling slow motion into the water. I laughed and laughed and laughed. I thought that was really. Fun. I wish it was the somewhere under the sea song though. Maybe yeah. And oh, what did you think I of? That there would be a better callback. What do you think of their use of unforgettable? Uh, that. Uh, oh, a little bit too on the nose. A little bit like. What, who wrote it? I think Irvin Gordon wrote it, and it was for originally it was for like Nat King Cole. I think I I kind of if they have a third one, they need to use "Don't You Forget About Me." Oh, that'd be so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Oh, I, what did you think of the last part? I don't really understand why they were looking out into the distance, and they're like, "Oh, this is a great view." Yeah, unforgettable. I don't understand that part. No, it was. I I think the whole thing was that they were saying Marlin was saying every time they're at the edge of the reef, something happens and they cannot just sit there and take in the view. And I guess oh, like yeah, and okay. and so she was saying, can we just not go off on crazy adventures every time we reach here? Can we stop here and enjoy the view? And finally, at the end of their mission, they were able to do that. And I think okay. and and yeah, saying unforgettable is was was is a reference to Dory's. Uh, short term memory loss and and it it has one of the best taglines like an un unforgettable adventure she probably won't remember is really funny, that that's a good tagline, and uh mm-hmm. oh did did you like the post credit scene with the escapees? I didn't watch it. Oh no. I left. But you I know about it, right? Or something. You kn- yeah, I do. I know what happens at yeah. the end, but. The... They should not have lasted that long, but <laughs> oh, it's just a movie. What tipped me off to it was in the credits. You have Willem Dafoe and everybody else in the first movie. I was like, wait, 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 wait. They did not show up. So that must mean there's, a, there's an extra scene. Mm, yeah. I did not even think about that. I just went, oh crap, it's midnight, we have to go. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah so that, that yeah, they definitely would not have lasted that long. I, I always thought that at the end of the first movie, the blowfish broke them out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> that that makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's alright. At least they're still alive, I, right? <laughs> yeah, they're, at least they're still alive. Yeah, I, I think that at okay. the end of the day, considering, you know, how cash-grabby a sequel that is released so long after the original movie can be, which will bring us to our second film, uh, this, this <laughs> was... This had a decent story. They thought about it, and they, they put effort into it, and I think... A, a big part of why it got made was like the furious campaigning that Ellen did on her TV show and she kept on demanding a sequel. And and I felt that instead of it being like, okay, we'll give Ellen what she wants, there was a good 
I, it, it, it justified his existence enough. I mean, it is a cash grab. Yeah. Without a doubt. But, but yeah, it's like we don't it's really... It's not a shameless cash grab. It is, yeah. We don't really need it. But at the same time, you can tell that the people who made it wanted to make it. The pe- and, and I'm glad that Andrew Stanton came back. And they yeah. had a lot of the people from the original movie back on it. So that was important for me. Who sang Under the Sea? Sorry? The Somewhere Beyond the Sea. That, that's Bobby Darin. Oh, it's not related. Did they write that song for this movie? No, I no, it's a it's a standard. Okay. It's like a jazz standard. Yeah. I I wish, I wish there was some sort of callback to that song, unless I missed it. Mm, yeah, there wasn't the trailers, I guess. It was. Yeah, it wasn't the trailers for Finding for Finding Dory. Okay. And I was like, oh, I remember that song from the trailers for Finding Dory. Okay, wait, wait. I want to say something else about this movie that I really liked, which was they kept the nostalgia level to a minimum. Yes. I I hate it when a film like Finding Dory comes out and you know it's just hey remember this as a child nostalgia nostalgia I hope you like it you know, I hate that fan, I hate fan service fan kind of service thing. Yeah. yeah and for this I felt like the real fan service came from Crush was his name Crush yes the yeah because he didn't really need to but, be there yeah yeah but there was. It was so short and it was just like a nice callback that it didn't feel inorganic. Yes, it I just agree. Felt like, okay, they needed the currents again, that's all. Yeah. And I know a guy. The so. <laughs> and and the interesting thing about this is that it's a period piece. It's set in the year two thousand and four. So oh, yeah. like there there must have been some anachronisms. There must have been somebody using an iPhone somewhere. And and something probably doesn't match up. But that was like I was wondering how are they going to make Clownfish live 15 years. Uh, but they just said oh, it the next year. Oh, why do you year. have to say that? <laughs> well, we must all come to terms with our mortality, Jerry. <laughs> this is bad. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so I, oh, I, poor, I liked it. Yeah. Poor Marlin. He's gonna lose his son again. No. <laughs> Maybe he'll die first. And that will be a bit less sad. <laughs> such a okay, terrible this has gone way too dark. Let, let's go back to the light part. Yeah. Let's right. let's swim up. <laughs> okay. Um. So, is there anything else you want to say about this film? Uh, there probably is, but I'm but I'm blanking right now. Oh, uh, Idris Elba. Yeah, I think he was much better in Zootopia, but he was okay here. I didn't even know it was him. Gerald. It's still right. <laughs> yeah, he was. There was yeah. one was him, and the other one was Dominic West, who's another like actor who always plays British gangsters and things. Mm mm. Okay. Gerald. Yeah, I, <laughs> I I like those two seals too. They're quite funny. Yeah, they. I like that the I like that they genuinely wanted to help Marlin yes. and Nemo for some reason. That's the one thing that I really enjoyed about this movie is there were no bad guys, and and normally that frustrates yeah. me. But I like that that it didn't do that thing where you know you meet someone who's slimy or manipulative or the beware of strangers trope, and and I think that by making the only thing close to a villain was a giant squid. And by making that, like, not sentient, like a monster, I was happy with that. that I like that there were no, like, intelligent villains that they had to fight, that it really was a road trip. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it could have been worse. I didn't like it as much as Jet did, mm-hmm. but I thought it was alright. I'm not going to watch it again. Yeah, But I maybe think... if I do, if I see a Disney Channel, I, I will watch it again on, on Disney Channel. Am I saying it right? I don't know. All right, let's just go on to Independence Day. Oh uh, yeah, Surgeon. I wait. I I I kind of I did not watch it in three D, but I feel that it would have been gorgeous in in three D. Finding Dory. Wait, Finding Dory. Okay. Yeah, Finding Dory. I thought Resurgence because I would have puked in three D. <laughs> <laughs> if I watched it in three D, I mean. I watched it in three D with moving seats. <laughs> so. Oh wow. Okay. So um, I I would usually ask you what the plot is, but I want to try to understand what the plot is in this film. Okay, let's go. So. If I'm not wrong, because I I totally forgot everything that happened in Independence Day, aliens come back and destroy things, and then humans fight back, right? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. basically that's it. Pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Cherry. <laughs> uh, all right, this film, both of us sort of okay with it, right? Yeah, like... You know, I want to know your views on this. <laughs> okay. So, Roland Emmerich 
as a director, his filmography is is really bombastic and Shit. and it's marked by Sorry. a lot of yeah, <laughs> it's marked by a lot of wanted destruction. But at the same time, I feel like there's a naivete and something endearing about his writing that makes me like him a lot more than Michael Bay when they are basically the same kind of director in the kind of movies they make. But I feel like Roland Emmerich has this sort of very uh, pure belief in humanity that Michael Bay does not. Michael Bay is really cynical. And I, I feel that the Roland... That, that, I mean, there is a lot of cynicism be, into the making of Independence Day Resurgence. But in the story, it's it's, it's kind of charming in how childlike and, and, oh, you know, that's the way you think the world works. How adorable. And and I kind of I kind of like that about Roland Emmerich. Like if you watch twenty twelve, twenty twelve is a bit of a guilty pleasure of mine because obviously it's a g- enormously stupid movie. But at the end of the day, I can't bring myself to hate it. And I guess I yeah, had a yeah I had a little bit of that with Independence Day Resurgence too. You know twenty twelve I I went to the wrong theater. I forgot what I was supposed to watch, but. I went to the wrong theatre and I ended up watching 2012. And it turned out it wasn't as terrible as I thought it was. Plus, my friend who was watching it with me, she was having the time of her life because she thought everything was so dumb and she was just laughing at every single <laughs> death on screen. Yeah. Because it was so over the top. I kind of had that in Independence Day Resurgence as well. I think that was the one shot where all the fighter jets are flying their flags in space during the ceremony. And I turned to my dad and I was like, this movie is perfect. <laughs> Oh, we're gonna spoil everything. There was one scene that um reminded me of Star Wars. Even from like down to the it's trap thing. Although I I completely forgot why it was a trap, but you know, they had to go inside the core to like make it explode. Yeah. I was like, huh, this is just like Star Wars. It it is so, and yeah. yeah, and and especially okay, a bit oh, like a big part of like one of my big problems with this one is that it's completely an alternate universe because the world has completely changed after the events of Independence Day and it's totally sci-fi because they've, they've co-opted alien technology and now they have alien weapons and they have levitation and it's completely unrecognizable from you know 2016 of today. So that's fine. But at the same time, I felt that it took away a very big uh, v- part of the verisimilitude of the first movie because Independence Day is by no means a realistic film, but you can recognize it as present-day... New York, Washington DC, or wherever, you feel like, okay, this is close enough to a real-life scenario. And then their big reveal is the whole thing about Area 51 and the alien ship they found a long time ago. And that is the big buy. But in this one, from the beginning, you have to completely suspend your belief. And the problem is that if you start out so stupid, the stupider you get, the more you lose the audience. (laughs) Does, Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Oh, you know, your audience just starts embracing it like crazy. Yeah, o- honestly, like, I was thinking about it, and I feel that every single thing Independence Day Resurgence tried to do, Pacific Rim did much better. Yep. And, and like, it's it's such an unnecessary sequel, and there are several ideas which I, I like, and I guess they are kind of obvious ideas. The main thing being, you know, President Whitmore, Bill Pullman, has PTSD. And he's completely yeah. shattered and broken by what happened in the Alien War. I like that. I thought that there was a good mm. amount of character development. And it was probably the most serious part of a very goofy movie was his whole problem and his whole uh, hauntedness. But the stereotypes in this movie are really, really over the top. At the same time, I don't feel like there was any malice. I don't feel like it's like when Michael Bay does racist jokes. Like, I don't think yeah. Roland Emmerich is racist. I think he's just naive. Yeah. <laughs> and to, I, I there's agree a, with you. you do, right? And there's there's a charm to it. At the same time, yeah, like I totally agree with what you said. Uh you had a Facebook status update where you said um pandering to China is the new product placement. And I said, Yeah, you're totally correct. This is yeah, so because, much pandering like, to China I, in this movie. I watch now you see me too, and it took place in China. Yeah. And I was like, Jay Chow hell? for no reason. He's in there for nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Except, you know, to pander to Chinese people Yeah, and, and in this movie, like, they use Chinese Skype Which is QQ And they drink, like, a Chinese brand, brand of milk And of course, Singapore is part of China Yeah, yeah. no, the thing is I, I was like, oh my god, this is this is the part where it's Singapore And then there's this guy who's talking And, like, he's at the back of the taxi It's a Chinese and taxi he started, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. He started speaking, and he had the China accent. Yeah, to it, he was speaking of a, like, Wait, a China accent. Hell? Yeah, and and, and I, then you <laughs> see like people running in the road. Oh, oh, sorry, they're running on the road, and it's like full of Chinese people. And then they had this close-up shot of um the noodle takeaway box thing. And I was like, okay, they clearly think that this is China. Yes. But nope, you see the Singapore skyline, and I was like, huh. All right. And what was? I mean, but it's. <laughs> but I feel like Go that ahead. that's part of the charm. Like they got it wrong, and they're trying to pander to China. But at the same time, they're not pandering to China because that's not China. That's Singapore, which is like one of the lowest, the, the worst places you can ever try to appeal to in terms of film because we're so damn small. Exactly. So I thought that was super funny. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I wasn't even offended. I was just so amused. Me too. Totally agree. I was not offended at all, and and I think. I guess that there's a degree of recognizability to our skyline, to MBS, but honestly, I feel like we have got a long way to go if we're going to put, you know, MBS. That's that one of those things that bothered me about the Captain America Civil War promotion is they were trying to use MBS to rival the Eiffel Tower. I was like, please don't start. That's stupid. And and I guess it doesn't... <laughs> sorry, sorry. Sorry, MBS. You're an ugly building, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I... Hey, wait a minute. No, I like it. I like it. It looks like three decks of card, which is what they wanted. <laughs> I'm not being sarcastic. I do like it. The, sp- the surfboard of the gods. <laughs> That's what I refer to the fool as. The surfboard <laughs> of the gods. And here's the thing, right? It, it could have been uglier. Have you seen our buildings It here? could have been uglier, yeah. The, the thing is that, like, you're totally right. If they wanted to pattern to China, why not blow up Shanghai? You know, like, everyone knows the Shanghai skyline. And, and and that was so weird. And very recently, when Melissa McCarthy and Paul Feig came, one of the celebrity gossip sites, I think Jess Jarrett, wrote about them being here. And you saw that whole thing, right? They they said that Ghostbusters yeah. in Singapore, comma China. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Me too. And, no, but the thing is, I don't even blame Americans because they're so damn huge. To be honest, I didn't even know that New York and LA was so far away from. You did not know that they were like opposite coasts. Ago. Okay, yeah. And like, yeah, if you like, gave me a map of Africa and you asked me to point to Chad, I cannot point to Chad. I'm sorry. So yeah, I totally and, get it. Yeah. And, and it's like, honestly, I thought LA snowed, but it doesn't. <laughs> so I was kind of shocked. I was like, hmm, does LA snow? No, in, it's the in, West in, Coast. In, uh, yeah. It doesn't, yeah. So sure, yeah, I completely mean, forgivable. And yeah. Chin Han, like I was so excited to see Chin Han, even though he was in this for a really short time. I mean, he's always, like, he always ends up dead anyway. He does, yeah. But you look at the guy's credits and, oh my gosh, you know, Dark Knight, Captain America, Winter Soldier, Arrow, uh, 2012. And I forgot who he was in Winter Soldier. He was one of the councilmen, the international council that Robert Redford killed. Of course. Yeah, so. he was He was a councilman from China. And, and like, on Arrow, he was killed by John Barrowman. It was kind of funny. Uh, and... But I wanted to see in him in Dark Knight. He was killed by the Joker. That's right. Yeah. I'm assuming. I wanted uh, to see him in a spaceship. Right? The money. Yeah, he was burned on the pile of money. I I wanted yeah. to see him in a spaceship, but he was the base commander. Oh, Angela Baby stuck out like such a sore thumb in this. It was so annoying. She couldn't pull oh? any of this off. Um, the Chinese pilot Rain. Oh, I thought she was pretty. Oh, uh, she looked so out of place, like with 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 all of the other pilots, and and Liam Hemsworth is so boring, like. They, like he's one of those guys I think that Hollywood will try to push on us for a while longer. I mean, like Jai Courtney a little bit, but maybe marginally more. No, I think Liam Hemsworth has more charisma than Jai Courtney. Yeah, a little bit. Because Jai Courtney, he has. I mean, at least Chris Hems. No, Chris, sorry. Liam Hemsworth is nice to look at. He is, he's, he's, he's really handsome. He's not as talented as his brother, but I feel like there's some untapped potential in him. Or maybe it's just me looking at his abs. I don't know. Yeah, he's. But, <laughs> yeah. That's the thing, right? I, I feel that he is. There's a very boy bandish quality about him. Like, you could stick him in with, with, with something like a One Direction and it wouldn't be out of place. And I guess he will always be stuck in his brother's shadow which I feel a bit sorry for him, but I feel the most sorry for Luke Hemsworth. There's a third Hemsworth brother, everyone. Yeah. Go Google him, otherwise you'll feel one, right? sad. Yeah. It's so sad to look but at the picture. I, like, <laughs> I, think, I think Liam Hemsworth should be... He shouldn't be the leading man because they've tried making him the leading man for so long and I don't think any of his films have ever succeeded besides... But it's not the Hunger Games. He's hardly in the Hunger Games. Totally agree. the last two films. Yeah, he's the third guy in the love triangle in the Hunger Games and he's fine. As the third yeah, guy, it makes sense triangle. because he's the hot one. Sorry. Yeah, he's he's the that tall one. That was very one. shallow of me. Sorry. <laughs> Josh Hutcherson is now sad. 
<laughs> no. Okay, seriously. Even in the books, I thought that Josh Hutchison's character was a really boring character, and I usually like the boring characters. Hence so that's Leonardo. When I don't yeah. like Peter Malak. Yeah, because you're Leonardo and a Cyclops fan. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, all right. And I love but, Captain America too. Yeah. And I love Superman. And people call them prunes, but I'm like, hey, they're good characters. Well, I don't know about Cyclops because I didn't read the X Men comics, but I liked him in the movies. Yeah, I think that it's always a challenge to write an inherently boring character in an interesting way. And, well, with this one, I felt that the whole thing is you can really feel Will Smith's absence, and he turned down the movie because he did. He demanded like $50 million for two movies back to back. Oh, I thought it was because of Suicide Squad. It's both, kinda. Yeah, I think I think the, at first it was he wanted $50 million for both movies back to back, and then they said no, and then Suicide Squad came along and said, like, I'll do that instead. Uh, and oh. yeah, so... Like, what did you think of his son? What did you think of the actor playing villain? He's the boring one in this film. Yeah, he is. But I... He has no charisma at all, and... He hardly does anything. Like I honestly thought that he was going to be the main character, or at least for the younger younger cast. Yeah, me too. But it turned out to be Liam Hemsworth, which I didn't like. No, neither did I. Yeah, he's the type of. I I was having such high hopes because he's Will Smith's son, or you know, in the film. Yes. Yeah. And it turned out he was just he was just someone to pull along in the plot, and I did not like what they did with his character, and I felt like it didn't do Will Smith's characters justice. Yeah, and, and and I mean, like I did feel a bit sorry for the character because both his parents die, and he sees his yeah. mom die. But I don't feel the impact as much as I should. And his mom because you do, you hardly see their relationship. It's yeah, like all these things are happening, and you're only doing that clearly just to emotionally manipulate the audience. Yes, I so because of that, it's so glaringly obvious that we won't give you what we what you want. Because you don't deserve that. Yeah, I I needed like a bonding scene between him and his mom, but I feel that that would have been really poorly written. Uh, also, mm-hmm. his mom is really impressive. She went from being a stripper to being a doctor. Like, good on you, man. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Chase and your then dreams. Die. Yeah, and then she died. Uh, and <laughs> this script it has so many writers in the credit, and it feels like it was written by a twelve year old. It's really funny because it's it's so clunky. And silly, and none of the dialogue is memorable, and none of not, the the plot points are really predictable. But at all of that said, I could not bring myself to hate this movie. I had fun with it, honestly. <laughs> honestly, I thought like the first few, okay, the first hour was pretty good. Then I think they were about to fight, like the jet planes. They went inside. Middle bit sacked out. so much. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that was when I started feeling the two hours. Me too. It was two hours, right? It felt like three. Yeah. <laughs> By the end of the film. Yeah, it was, it was two hours. And, ah, uh, okay. But, um, what did you think of bringing back Brackish Okun? I, I, I was so sure that the scientist had died, the crazy, you know, the crazy scientist who woke up from the coma. I was so sure they had killed him in the first movie. So I was very okay, curious when... Sorry. Sorry, I was very curious to find out how they had brought him back. I know people hated him, but I thought he was fine. Like, he's that cra- crazy scientist in every single world destruction alien alien movie, you know? Yeah. He's that scientist. So I was like, alright, you're, you're just that character. And I don't hate that character, because the whole, the whole film is so silly anyway. So having a silly character in a silly film, to me, isn't really a problem. Like, I thought he was fine. At least he was serviceable to the film. I agree. Yeah, I also like the bromance between him and his colleague. And, oh, yeah. it's not a bromance, trust me. <laughs> and 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 the thing is, it, yeah, like like I think I I don't remember who the gay character is supposed to be, but Roland Emmerich insisted there was going to be a gay character in the sequel. So I figured it must Isn't be. Isn't that both of them? May, maybe it's maybe it's both of them. Yeah, I, I don't know whether we we learned about Brackish Ogun's uh, relationship status in the first movie. But yeah, I, I guess yeah. they're gay. I'm pretty sure it's both of them because the way I forgot what his colleague is called, but um, it was like sitting the there way... for twenty years waiting for him to wake up. Yeah, yeah. I I honestly think that they're the gay character. It was cute. Which to yeah. me, was fine. Yeah, it was cute. It was sad. It was sad. Yeah, yeah, I felt sad at that part. And and I I feel that the movie needed more moments like that where we felt something, and I felt that I felt I'm using the word felt so much. 
<laughs> there's a craft material right. called felt. And uh, so so yes, it's... and the thing is we felt nothing from this film. Ah, yeah. Ah, yes. Thank Just you for bringing for it back. A lot back. of things that we felt, we felt nothing. Ha ha ha. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and 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 the thing was that the goofy sincerity of the first movie is so undercut by the pandering nature of this one. And it felt that there's so many things that they stuffed in as a man as as a mandate, like they were instructed to. And it's like this movie tagged. It did really poorly at the box office. And it was so presumptuous of them to end with a character literally yelling sequel. It's almost like what Well, the he end. didn't literally yell sequel. He it was as close to literally yelling sequel as he can get. Yeah. Yeah. He for all intents and purposes literally looked into the camera and yelled sequel. Uh, <laughs> um, but do you think it'll do well in China because they panned it to Singapore, China? It it did like okay in China, but like oh, it opened up in China already. Yes, I didn't know yeah, that. but I think it did like nowhere near as well as Captain America and things like that. I guess, and yeah, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> my, I have such mixed feelings about this movie. I like how the good alien sphere reminded me so much of Evie from Wally. It was like, oh, Evie came to help. <laughs> the design was all right. The the ending of the movie where the alien queen is chasing a school bus through the desert, I laughed so much. I was like, this is the most absurd thing I've ever seen. And people spend so much effort rendering that. And people spend so much effort going to New Mexico to film it. And people are trying to take it seriously, everyone in the school bus. And I, it was so funny. It felt like a spoof movie. And I enjoyed I feel, it. I feel so bad for... um. Darn, what's his name? The the president character. Yeah, Whitmore, Bill Pullman. Yeah, Bill Pullman, because he made this ultimate sacrifice and it meant nothing. Exactly. And I felt so sad. Yeah, it, it just came down to and shooting the monster. Character. Me too. That was, I think, the best, like, the best part of the movie was giving him the PTSD and developing his story up. Uh, I also like, uh, dang it, I'm forgetting all the names. George Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum, yeah. Jeff Goldblum, David yeah. Levinson, yes. And the the like, I really liked him in the first movie because he's the nerdy guy who has to become the action hero, and that's like my favorite archetype ever. Hence Donatello. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so like, I I felt that they the the buddy chemistry that he had with Will Smith in Independence Day was such an important part of why that movie worked, and you could feel that was mm-hmm. missing here. But yep. yeah, and and like the kids in the car, that that was so unnecessary. I really was annoyed by those kids. I wasn't, but they were really unnecessary. They anyway. were, yeah. But I I want to ask you: Do you think do you think this movie would have worked better if they focused more on Liam Hemsworth and um I keep forgetting the guy's name, Will Smith's son. What's it? Dylan, name? Jesse Usher. Yeah. Dylan. Yeah. Do you think that it will work? better if it focused on both their relationships and create some kind of bromance between both of them. Because I, I felt like there was so much potential in that in that backstory that they had that he almost killed Yeah, that they hated thing. each other. Me too, yeah. I felt that it was kind of cliche. It was like Top Gun. But something yeah, could but have come out of it. At the same time, it was something. Yeah, it like, was they something. Just, yeah. They just decided to be friends again because the world was going to end. Yeah. I guess it's a good enough excuse, but... At the same time, it felt so rushed. I assume I they would. Like that. I assume they would work through their issues. You're right. Yeah, and I kind of wish they had. For me, the big thing about this story is it feels like fan fiction. It feels like you would write, "Oh, what if everyone had kids, and these are all the kids, and all the kids are an adventure." So that's what it felt like. It felt like fan fiction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I do you like the actress who plays Patricia Whitmore, M- Michael Monroe. I think she's like gonna be a big star. I, I feel like she's positioned as the next like Jennifer Lawrence sort of. Ugh. Well, I wouldn't say that, but I do like her. A lot of people are upset that Mae Whitman wasn't right. in this film. Yes. But I thought that um, thought that what's her name, Micah Monroe. Yeah, Micah Monroe. She's very, she's very serviceable, and I like her. She cries a lot, though. But yeah, I, uh, I know. I, 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 I like. Her. I would like to have seen Mae Whitman in this, and and I guess I was, I was. I was kind of disappointed that her character didn't have much to do. I was like, come on, let her fly, let her fly. And then she did fly. Yes, I was happy at that too. she didn't do that much at the end. Yeah. Uh, she didn't really do that much at the end, but at least she did something. She which did. Which was so much better than what I thought. She did more she... than Angela Baby. <laughs> Who? Chinese pilot woman. Oh, okay. Yeah, so useless. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> she what... was just there as a romantic... Um, a romantic 
part and uh, sorry, a romantic interest for for the nerdy guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what? Did, well, he's not that nerdy. I think he's just a goofy the side character. Yeah. yeah. What did you think of this bizarre pairing of the African warlord and the nebbish accountant dude? <laughs> I liked it. Me too. I think people didn't like the nerdish accountant dude, right? Yeah. Um, okay, like... I thought he was fine. He's He was annoying, but to me, like, I appreciated the movie a little bit more when I realised, uh, when I found out that he's the tour guide from White House Down. Do you remember in White House Down, there's a tour guide who who is hiding... And he's, like, protecting all the tourists when the terrorists invade oh, the White House. Yeah, yeah. And he picks up the shotgun at the end. And, yeah, yeah. and and what is funny is in that movie he he like the actor improvised this line where he was showing a tourist a picture of the White House and said this is the part that got blown up in Independence Day <laughs> and then he's in the sequel and, and it turns out that he also co-wrote the script oh yeah yeah he's definitely the guy that people hated yeah cause cause I heard like there's this actor in the film that also wrote the film yeah Nicholas Wright that yeah. everyone didn't like and I was like oh I don't know who that is there's too many people in this film <laughs> yeah, that's, but yeah it's the, I like him I like him the patented Roland Emmerich cast of thousands and and I guess like who would you say is the main character in this I would say Jeff Goldblum so would I but it's supposed to be Liam Hemsworth yes I'm sure so that was the weird thing to me I was like if you feel like a movie can't decide who the main character is not because they want to share screen time but because they just don't have the right concept then that's a problem <laughs> I felt like mm. it was yeah I was a bit surprised when, during the end credits when Jeff Goldblum got second billing under Liam Hemsworth like wait what <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh, it's it's frustrating because there are many parts of this movie that are so bad it's good. There are many parts of this movie where you're just laughing your full head off because it's so silly and, and so fun. But there are also many parts of this movie where this falls so far short of the first one. I could not, for the life of me, remember the first film. So when I watched this, I just thought it was going to be a dumb film and it was. Yeah. But it's not dumb to the point where it's annoying. It's just dumb to the point where it's just dumb. Yeah, it's... it's... And I don't... I, 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 I like, I'm happy that I watched this new theatre because it's a theatre experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so for that reason, I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm kind of sad that it didn't do well because it's not a good film, but it is a fun one. Yeah, and... And I was kind of, I was like low-key excited for the sequel because I like Jeff Glo- Goblum's character a lot. Me too, yeah. Yeah, so it probably won't happen. I'm sure it will actually, but... Maybe. I, I hope it doesn't take another 20 years. Um, mm. you have read like Roland Emmerich has been very outspoken and he's made all these comments about Marvel yeah about about everything like he's about movies in general and the way he speaks it kind of feels like he's a bit bitter of being left behind and and it was it was really but why yeah I mean 2012 did super well didn't it I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it was it was weird because I feel like he he uh, I, I feel like his attitude is that these movies, Marvel blockbusters and all of these comic book movies have supplanted the 90s disaster genre that he was the king of. And like his roost at the box office has been taken over and he's been knocked off his perch. So he's a bit bitter about that. That's the sense that I got. And it was very interesting to me that the thing he took issue with was costumes. Like he was saying he doesn't, he can't, he can't uh, get into Marvel movies because they're wearing superhero costumes. And that is, like, that's a valid criticism to the extent that that's how you would think if you are an old person. <laughs> You're like, yeah. oh, they're wearing funny clothes. I don't get it. You know, that's 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 what would you, you would think. And, and I guess... And yet, and yet, human beings being able to defend themselves against aliens where other, other more advanced species couldn't make so much more sense. Precisely. Right? It's, yeah, it's, it's, he's, silly is his bread and butter. And, like, his movies are silly and there's nothing wrong with that. So for him to accuse something else of being silly, I guess it's a little bit weird. But at the same time, it's refreshing in that a lot of directors have to be very diplomatic and politically correct. And, oh, I love everything. And that can't be the truth. So yeah. at the same time, I'm also like, oh, you know, good good on you for speaking your mind. But you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And And I guess... It all comes back to that thing where I have, like, in my head, Roland Emmerich next to Michael Bay, and I like Roland Emmerich so much more, even though his movies are yeah. not that much better. 
Although I pity Michael Bay for some reason. I know there's something about his life that makes me so... I think it's just that people... He thinks that people don't get his films and it just doesn't get through to him that he just makes bad films. As in bad Transformer films. Yeah, and, and he justifies it by saying, I make movies for 12-year-olds. You know, but hey, you know, E.T. is made for 12-year-olds. E.T. is brilliant. <laughs> So yeah, it's well, it's yeah, I I think there's a lot of condescension in a Michael Bay movie, and a lot of like we think the audience are idiots, and and in something like Independence Day, sure, there's a bit of that too, but most of it is really that this is how Roland Emmerich sees the world, and this is his weird lens through which he views the world, and and there's still a little bit of that Europeanness where he's like, I don't really get America, <laughs> yeah. you know, and and I feel that that's charming. It's so funny when he made The Patriot, which was that movie with Mel Gibson about, you know, he's fighting against the evil uh, British and he's, he's the American freedom fighter and Jason Isaacs is the villain in that one and it's such a cartoony, like, like hilariously evil villain and he's based on a historical character. So there's some weird, uh, like, fantasy that Roland Emmerich has about America and Independence Day is the biggest example of that. I didn't notice that the Petronas Twin Tower was, was dropped. <laughs> In London. Yeah. That was kind of funny. They picked up, like, all the skyscrapers. The Burj Khalifa. Asia. Yeah, they picked up the Burj Khalifa from Dubai. They were in down in London. And it's kind of funny that it was, like, released on Brexit Day. <laughs> yeah. It's sad. Oh, well. Yeah. Uh, okay, we've got to, like, stay away from politics. Danger, danger. Stay away from politics. So, yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to say about Independence Day Resurgence? It's all right. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. Like, I would not watch it the second time at all. Like, I would just avoid this film because it's so long and it's kind of boring at certain parts. And by certain parts, I just mean the Liam Hemsworth part for some reason. Yeah. I don't know. I find him such a boring character. And his and, and his best... Not best friend. Le, Dylan. Yeah, he's really boring too. So you have two boring main protagonists which doesn't bode well for your film. Yeah, I like... But yeah, I... I, I'm I'm glad I watched this film. It's a good, dumb film. Because I just needed that day to pass. So I just watched <laughs> this film. And it worked, and I'm glad I did. It's just that I'll never watch it again because it's not worth my time. Yeah, and like out of the young cast, the most interesting character is Patricia Whitmore, and I feel that it would have been a lot better if she were the main character. Because of her whole thing. Okay. With, and, oh, wait, wait. Like, we completely forgot about Celia Ward, like, woman president who is just there and yeah, oh, yeah. I was disappointed because like I like Celia Ward a lot I think she's 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 got the presence about her like you could believe her as the president like when they said yeah. we're casting Celia Ward as the president it's like oh awesome <laughs> she she played like uh, Harrison Ford's wife in The Fugitive and it's a bit funny because Harrison Ford played the president and now she played the president too so that makes me a little bit happy for some reason <laughs> um what else is there to say? Oh, the Batman v Superman uncut version is coming out soon, so hopefully we get to review that. I heard it's pretty good. 30 minutes extra. Yeah, the, uh, the ultimate edition. Since there's nothing coming out in, on like 9 of July, I think. That week. Yeah, there's like, I think Tarzan's out now, I guess, if you want to watch Oh, hang that. on. I don't think Batman v Superman is out by then. No, oh, yeah. We'll, we'll probably talk about Ghostbusters then. Maybe. I guess. I like, yeah. Batman v Superman, is, it's being released online like for for download on amazon or things like that three weeks before blu-ray so yeah. like i probably will have to wait for the physical one we'll see what happens yeah i'm waiting for the physical one. yeah too. the main thing i heard is that clark can talks a lot more like he articulates yeah he articulates his beef with batman a bit more so i'm looking forward to that i also really want to see what jenna malone looks like as barbara gordon like i purposely not google she, anything. she's not barbara gordon no <laughs> wait okay. wait what Okay, t- tell me more. He's just a forensic scientist. Ah, crap! <laughs> I, this is the this is like the longest I believe one of those lies. Normally, I uh. I let go of it really fast. Normally, like when someone says such and such a person is playing this in a comic book movie, I'm like, nah, they're not. But for this one, I like really, really believed it. <laughs> I went for the Batman v Super Run, uh, Batman v Superman Run. Oh, cool! That tell us about that. Place yeah. this Sunday. Oh. Uh, nothing really happened. We just ran. Cool. But okay. the medal was really cool. Nice. I really liked it. Yeah, I think I saw a photo of that on your Facebook. That's cool. So no, I didn't put it on Facebook. I put it on, on Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, your Instagram, which you don't use a lot. <laughs> yep. 
follow us on Instagram, guys. Do you, do you want to tell people what you don't have one? <laughs> I don't even know how to use Instagram. I just take a picture and then I put it. I'm like, I guess that's the thing. I'm at Jet the Jedi, so please, please, please follow me. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. J -E -T 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 -T. I'm not gonna tell you what mine is. So it's it's all like toy photos. Anyway. So I have okay. so many pictures of my toys. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. So that's it. I think this week we're gonna review Tarzan. The Legend of Tarzan. Yeah. Which which the I Legend enjoy. Legend of Tarzan. It's kind of surprisingly. Oh. Yeah. I feel like you might. Like I hope it. I like it. I like I like the. Well, I didn't really like Order of Phoenix that much. But the other three were I okay. Like the other three movies of Harry Potter. So hopefully this is good too. Yeah, and, and you like Margot Robbie as well, right? So Yeah. Yeah. But I saw the trailer before I think Independence Day. She really looks like a damsel in distress. So hopefully what you said about her being sassy, I hope that's she's really that sassy. True for me. Yeah, I, I think yeah. the main thing is that she's she's smart. Like she is uh she understands the other cultures and she has made great efforts to to learn about she's not ignorant. And she's not entitled. Mm. Yep. Yeah. And apparently in the original novels, she was American. She wasn't British in like the original books. So they went back to the source for that. You mean like like the movies? Yeah. In, in, in the Disney movie, she's really, really British. She's voice of Minnie Driver. Yeah. But in the books, she's American. And in this movie, she's American too. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I guess that, that does it for us. Thanks. Thanks again, Jerry. Thanks, everyone, for listening. All right. Bye. Bye, Bye. See you this Monday, maybe. Okay. See you guys. Bye. <laughs> <Okay. laughs>